I think that that's something that a lot of authors see is, you know, they see this huge bestseller and they think like, oh my gosh, that was just like an overnight success. They really don't know the, the years that, you know, went into it. People who have had that sort of huge success, it started with, you know, coming up with the ideas and, and doing the research, the slow build so that when they're ready to work on the book, they have a following, they have ideas and they're able to go to a publisher and, and have, you know, this great idea, but then all this other stuff supporting it. I will be looking at the traditional book publishing world with the help of a literary agent named Danya Dickerson. Danya joined a New York-based agency called Avidas last November after 21 years at book publisher McGraw-Hill Education. In our discussion, Danya and I talk about the state of book publishing for thought leaders and for thought leadership professionals who want to secure publishing contracts for the experts in their firm. We also discuss what thought leaders must bring to the table to attract the interest of a literary agent and book publishers. You'll also hear Danya's take on authors who are using generative AI to write their books and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And with numerous hybrid book and self-publishing options today, we talk about why thought leaders shouldn't abandon their desire to work with agents who could get them contracts with traditional publishers. Hello, Danya. It is great to have you on our show. I think we just uh, mentioned the last time we saw each other in person was roughly 10 years ago at a uh, where you gave a presentation at a conference that I was hosting. So great to see you again. Yeah, it's wonderful to see you too. And and yeah, that was a great conference, very much in the, the theme of, you know, how to help thought leaders get their ideas out there. So love that you're continuing that theme. The first question is, um, you know, you've been in the book publishing industry largely as an agent in the last year or so. Coming from the book publishing industry for more than 20 years, what do you see as the key trends that that are affecting people now today who want to be seen as thought leaders? You know, what trends have been positive? What trends have been negative? And give us the big picture, because my understanding of book publishing is it has changed pretty fast, pretty dramatically in even just the last four years or so. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is such a great question. Um, and as you pointed out, I am an agent. I'm at Avidas Creative Management, but it's it's a new role for me, less than a year. But prior to that, I was at McGraw-Hill um, for over 20 years and at Writer's Digest Books before that. At McGraw-Hill, I ran the business list. So worked so closely with thought leaders trying to understand, you know, how they can make the book a part of their thought leadership. And um, so definitely seen major trends in the last 20 years. I, I think probably the biggest um, is this idea of a thought leader as the content creator. Um, I, I think that that has some pros mostly to go with it. I, I think it's a very good thing, but I do think there's a few downsides to that. Um, you know, I think as a content creator, your your book is just part of your overall brand and content um, reach to your audience. So, you know, I, I think what's so exciting about that is that you can use whatever platform your audience is on, whether it's LinkedIn, which I think probably for most thought leaders it is, but, you know, it's Instagram, it's, you know, newsletter, newsletters, it's lots of other different ways that you can reach an audience. And you can use that to, you know, really test your ideas, see what resonates, um, you know, see what kind of questions people are asking, because that's a pain point that you could probably address in a book. And, and so it's really a, a wonderful way to build your audience and grow your audience and be able to do some initial research with your audience in terms of what a book might be about or, or where you should go with the direction of your business as a thought leader. I think that that's a really wonderful thing. It's also nice because if you do have a book or other products that you want to sell, you also have a way to reach your audience directly and sell to them directly. So, you know, I, I think that that's really good. I think the downside of that twofold is that it's it's a noisy space now and it, it's hard to stand out. So I think thought leaders have to really hone their brand, be authentic and really you know, constantly think of ways to differentiate themselves from other people who are in the same space. Um, and then you have to be consistent. And I think that's really hard when you have 
clients who need you right away or book deadlines or other things going on. It's It can be a lot to sort of constantly come up with new ideas and um, create new content. So that, that's a downside. In terms of other overall trends, I think one of the exciting things that um, we've seen over the last 20 years in the world of publishing is that the way that book content is delivered has really changed too. So obviously it's print book, it's the ebook, it's the audio book. Um, you know, some people are figuring out ways to build courses out of their books. So, you know, it's it's really figuring out how your audience wants to have your content delivered to them and then delivering it in multiple ways so you can reach lots of different people. So so I think that that's really exciting as well and something that's really changed over the past 20 years. Yeah. So you have the benefit of more than 20 years at McGraw-Hill and then, you know, even before that. But just let's say at McGraw-Hill, are you, were you involved the entire time in business and management books during those years? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was on the business team the entire time. I started out as a junior editor and then worked my way up to the associate publisher that that oversaw the whole list. Um, and that category is really broad. This business can be leadership, it can be sales, it can be entrepreneurship, it can also be investing or real estate. So, you know, it, it's a very broad category. And I think that there's lots of opportunities for thought leaders, if they are in the business space, to, you know, really kind of find their niche. And that's actually really a kind of another trend that's happened over the 20, past 20 years. And certainly you can be a thought leader outside the world of business. You can be a thought leader on healthcare or parenting or many, many, many topics. So at at McGraw-Hill, going back to the early 2000s, say 2000, Mm -hmm. I think when you got there, would it be fair to say you saw between then and 2023 last year, you saw a steady increase in unsolicited manuscripts coming your way of people pitching you and the folks you managed book proposals and, and manuscripts? You know, to be honest, I've never really tracked it enough to know. I mean, I I think it was always sort of a steady stream of proposals coming in. Um, And, you know, I always really encouraged my team to be entrepreneurial. I think that a lot of it is kind of finding the undiscovered gem out there and bringing them in. I think that that's really important, too. I, I will say that. I think that, you know, definitely the rise in sort of more niche categories, which becomes harder for, you know, a bigger publisher to to handle. So where we probably got more niche proposals, those are probably the ones we were rejecting more. Um, But I, I think that there were more people who were reaching a very specific audience who were publishing books and finding success that way. So certainly, it seems to me there are many more book publishing options today than there were 20 years ago for authors. Self-publishing has always been around, but hybrid, hybrid publishing appears to really have taken off. Just a quick review on these three publishing options. Traditional book publishers, if they accept your book proposal and manuscript, will foot the cost to print, sell, and distribute your book through retail channels. They'll give you a cut of sales royalties, However, in comparison, hybrid publishers such as Greenleaf and IdeaPress will try to sell your book to distributors and retailers, but you'll pay them to design, edit, and print your book. However, you'll collect a higher percentage of sales from your book versus traditional publishers. And the third option, self-publishing, is a little different. You'll pay them to design, edit, and print your book, but they won't sell it to distributors or retailers. You'll have to sell it yourself. If you want more information about the hybrid book publishing option, one place to check is the Independent Book Publishers Association, which you can find at ibpa-online.org. And so it would seem to me the demand for books by book publishers, if you include the traditional publishers like McGraw-Hill and Wiley and Penguin Portfolio, et cetera, and the hybrid publishers now, and the self-publishing options, that this, the demand for books by publishers has increased. But has the quality of you know, proposals and manuscripts increased as well to keep up with increasing demand for authors? 
Yeah, no, I think that that's a really good question. So I think that, you know, in terms of just the the quantity of books that are being published, I mean, I think across the board in all categories, whether it's, you know, business or nonfiction or fiction or young adult, like so many more books are being published now. Um, And a lot of that is because of the rise of hybrid publishers or smaller independent publishers or self-publishing. So I think that what I've seen over you know my time in publishing is that this kind of quantity has exploded. And I think because of that, the sort of different categories that you mentioned have sort of found their own strength. So I think for publishers that, you know, probably the number of books that they publish in certain categories, especially the business category, has not changed that much. I I would almost even wonder if it's kind of shrunk a little bit, but they've had to really focus on quality. I mean, I think because books now are competing with podcasts and television shows and everything that's online, they, they have to make sure that they're very well written, well researched books by people who, you know, are recognized in their space as the expert. So I, I think the bar is pretty high for traditional publishers. Um, I think though that that doesn't mean that the other groups aren't demanding the same kind of quality. And I, I think hybrid publishers, absolutely, they, you know, they want to sell books. And in order to do that, it needs to be a really high quality book. I think the hybrid publishers are able though to take a bit more risk and um, maybe publish something that might be considered niche by a bigger publisher and do a bit more, you know, interesting things because of their business models. Um, And then self-publishing, I think that self-publishing can be a good opportunity for a lot of people. I mean, there are certainly people who want control of the entire process. And if that's you, self-publishing might be, you know, a better, a better role for you. It also is is good for people who really are targeting niche audiences. And I I think when it comes to quality, I think that there are a lot of self-published books that are, you know, amazing quality. People either are great writers or they find a great editor, you know, they work really hard to make sure that their book is self-published or the the self-published book is great because it's representative of their brand. Fortunately, I do think that because self-publishing has become become so easy and affordable that there are people who they probably publish too quickly and they don't really take the time to make their book great. You know, their book reads like a first draft because it is a first draft. Um, So I I think that I think that's where sometimes self-publishing gets a bad reputation for sure. But, you know, I would say that there's probably all levels of quality for self-published books. So for the traditional publishers, if if an author has self-published or gone to a hybrid publisher and pu- and published a really good book, really good book, mm-hmm. does that raise his or her, that author's chances of getting the attention of a traditional publisher? Does the traditional publisher look at that and say, wow, this person knows how to write? We'll, we'll read their proposal. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with then how the book has sold. There's a lot of amazingly well-written books out there that unfortunately just never found an audience. And, you know, maybe that's because it wasn't really the kind of book that people were interested in or there wasn't real need for that book. So it could be an indication that the author really wasn't marketing the book like they should have and really integrating it into their brand and their business and, you know, looking for ways to actually sell it. And I think probably a publisher, if they saw low numbers, would be concerned of that. Um, if, however, the author has self-published a book and just sold sold it like crazy, then I think that that's definitely going to be attractive to the publisher when they are coming around with their second book. In one of your LinkedIn posts, you wrote about some mega best-selling books that actually were not overnight successes. Can you talk about some of them and how long it took them to get market traction and then how they got market traction? What is it in which the audience audience finally said, 
this is a good book and sales went up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that that's something that a lot of authors see is they see this huge bestseller and they think like, oh my gosh, that was just like overnight, <laughs> an overnight success. They really don't know the, the years that went into it. And, um, you know, one of my favorite books on this topic is The Long Game by Dory Clark. I highly recommend that for anyone who wants to be a thought leader because it really is about, you know, very strategically, consciously, conscientiously sort of building your your brand and that it can take time. I, I know that's frustrating, but I think if you put in the effort, the end result is definitely worth it. So in terms of like, well, what does that look like? You know, I mean, I, I think that for a lot of people who have had that sort of huge success, it started with really kind of coming up with the ideas and and doing the research and and sort of putting the the time into really kind of understanding what else was out there and how your research might be different or how your ideas might be different and really kind of testing it with their with their audiences and starting to write stuff on LinkedIn and build their platform and really kind of a, the slow build so that when they're ready to work on the book, they have a following, they have ideas that, you know, they've built a following around and they're able to go to a publisher and, and have this great idea, but then all this other stuff supporting it. Um, so that by the time the book is launched, they've got a whole hungry audience ready for this book. And I, I can think of a lot of examples for that. Um, Dory's book, that book. She's written several of them. Did that book you mentioned, did it take some time before that book kind of hit success? That I don't know because I, I didn't work with her. I think she publishes with Harvard. So I think that for her book, it's really kind of talking about her her first book and how that really took time. The one that I was thinking about, this is a, a much older book, but it's kind of a, an interesting story in terms of like publishing is Who Moved My Cheese? I mean, that's a very old book, but we did a Who Moved My Cheese seminar when I was at McGraw-Hill. And, and I, I think people thought that like, oh, they wrote this kind of funny story about mice and cheese and change and leadership. And it just was like an instant overnight success. But really, I mean, they were like building their speaking and their consulting so that they were able every time they spoke to make sure everyone got a copy of that book and there were built-in sales. And that's really, you know, what kind of catapulted it to the list. And after that book was published, I would say for like five or 10 years, I got so many proposals for fables because I think everyone thought it was the fable format that was what sold that book. But I would argue, and again, I didn't work with these authors. I only you know, observed it over a year, but I would argue that it was their training machine that they had in place before the book came out. Their ideas and, you know, everything that they had that kind of went around the, the book that made that a success. And that certainly didn't happen overnight. Yeah, I think uh, Jeffrey Moore's um, first book, Crossing the Chasm, mm -hmm. I think it was around 1992. I think that didn't become a mega bestseller at mm -hmm. first. I think it took some time that he's written about that to become kind of the big hit that it, it eventually became. Yeah, I think that that's a really important lesson that it's a marathon and not a sprint. I've said that so many times to so many authors over the years, and it's, it's hard when you're feeling impatient and you want to be successful. But I, I think, you know, just remembering that all these people who have reached amazing levels of success like they had to really roll up their sleeves so the author comes to you you publish his or her book and after six months you know not much market interest are there a lot of those authors who say all right i'm i'm off to the next book or i'm not publishing book again do you see a lot of authors who give up especially first-time authors who give up too early yeah definitely i think that um yeah they, they give up early and they don't quite grasp how important it is to market the book. That's really a big part of their responsibility. And certainly, you know, a publisher is going to be helping with that. But I think because 
the book is such an important part of the brand that an author is building, you know, they're in control of making it something that's successful. So it's really important that before that book is out, they really think about how they're going to promote it and integrate it for the very long term. Shifting gears here, different topic, but very timely. The use of generative AI to perhaps even write book proposals. Have you seen any that you suspect have been proposals that were written by generative AI or whole manuscripts? I always feel like, you know, I have to keep confidential any proposals that I've seen. I don't need names. I don't need names. Yeah. <laughs> I did get one that was, that was, they were very overtly that it was co-written with with AI, um, as for whatever that means. But yeah. and. And I should say, you know, that obviously these are my opinions and, and not that of Avidas, not just this question, but everything that I'm saying. I think that AI is something that publishers are trying to wrap their head around, agents are trying to wrap their head around, writers are trying to wrap their head around, because I think there's worry on both sides. Publishers are worried that authors are going to use AI. Authors are worried that publishers are going to have their design, their cover designed by AI. And so it makes sense that there's a lot of conversation around it right now, that as new contracts are being negotiated, they're trying to get some kind of language for AI and all those agreements. I mean, it's it's tricky. I think I think when people really start to think about it, they, they might not even realize how much AI is already a part of the things we do. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I sometimes I'm writing an email and I have one thing I'm gonna say and it suggests something else and I use it. And you know, I think everyone is doing that. Um, but that's in an email and that is much different than a book. And you know, I, I definitely don't think that an author should use AI to write their book. I mean, there's so many people out there who have great ideas, and I, I think that. If they, if somebody wants to use AI to to help actually write their book, it can, they're, they're sort of taking away the opportunity for someone else who's writing their own book and putting in the hard work to do it. Um, and, and to me, I don't think that that's very fair. And I, I think there's also some AI tools that aren't as helpful as people think they are. Um, again, you know, we, I had an author once who decided to very, very late in the game when the book was really about to go to the printer, put their whole book through Grammarly. And, you know, I think that's probably a great tool for someone who's, you know, writing a professional cover letter or, or some other really professional document. But the fact of the matter is, is that it made the book very sort of stiff and formal um, instead of conversational. And I, I even think when I'm editing, I see all the sort of like suggestions of edits. And and there are many, many times where the, the author's writing style is, is more casual or more sort of fluid that they're training to tighten up that, in my opinion, would make it a much more sort of stale prose as opposed to, you know, the, the person's really kind of unique writing that has come out naturally. So... I think that people who want to use AI in a book, I don't think that that's really a great way to represent your thought leadership. I mean, I I think that there's probably ways you can use it to sort of start on a research path, but again, just start on it, you know, have AI suggest some things and then you still have to like look them up and read them and see where that takes you and, and do the other research. But again, that's... That's still something that I think we're all figuring out. For sure. So changing the topic again, we deal, and I have dealt for many years with people, business people who want to write a, a business book or a management book, and they try to secure an agent, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. What are the three biggest pieces of advice that you would give, especially first-time business book authors, in trying to get an agent uh, interested and obviously to take them on? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I think, first of all, there's so many different agents out there, and they all represent lots of different things. So you really want to target an agent and, and make sure that they, you know, are interested in your category. I mean, the, the same way you would target a publisher, 
make sure that they're interested in the category that you're writing in and that they have, you know, some experience in that category. Um, I think that that's, that it, it's a relationship. Ideally, you're going to write many books over many years and, and you want someone that really kind of understands your ideas and is able to represent them and sell them and really, uh, you know, kind of targeting an agent in order to do that um, is a great way. It, it's really important. Um, so I think that that's definitely lesson number one. Um, and, and I think secondly is understanding that an agent knows the business. They might have some suggestions in terms of how to make the proposal better, you know, how to make it more sellable and just being really, you know, kind of open-minded to that feedback. I think one challenge for thought leaders is because the book represents their business and their brand. And they've been so in control of that to have somebody come in and say something that not necessarily negative, but that it, it's feedback, you know, it can be hard to hear. So I just really recommend keeping an open mind to that. And then I, I think it's talking with your agent about sort of the bigger picture goals that you have. I think for thought leaders, the book is one piece of the puzzle. And so an, an agent should be able to really kind of help them think big picture in terms of, is this the right next book for your brand? Is this, you know, how you want to scale your business? And and certainly an agent isn't responsible for those things. But when it comes to just sort of giving some good advice on what you should be writing about, if they understand the goals that you have as a thought leader, they're going to really be able to kind of help you achieve that. Yeah, very good. Advice such as don't quit your day job yet, you know, counting on the mega <laughs> bestseller. <laughs> I have had that happen. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not as an agent, but as an editor. Okay. Finally, uh, since we have a lot of our audience are not thought leaders or people who even aspire to be thought leaders, they're people I call thought leadership professionals. They're editors, ghostwriters, graphic artists who are working on, on graphics for thought leadership content, and people who want to work in the book publishing industry and who want to be editors, acquisition editors, manuscript editors, uh, and maybe even literary agents. So if somebody wants to make a career in editing, in securing editing and publishing books by thought leaders or people who aspire to be thought leaders, what are the three biggest things that those people must do for a successful career, especially given publishing, book publishing is changing right before our eyes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think the fact that the, it's changing is there's a lot of opportunities I and mean, certainly within, you know, the model of traditional publishing, but there's so many other ways that people can find opportunities. And I think one of the things that's kind of unique about publishing is that in many ways, it's almost sort of a apprenticeship type industry. So a lot of people start out as assistants and, and they kind of learn the very unique ways that publishing works and start building those relationships. And, and then they come up in their career that way. So I definitely think for for the younger people who are listening to this, you know, if, if they're just getting starting out, finding any kind of internship or sort of part-time role where they can really kind of learn from people who have been in this industry or finding some kind of mentor or somebody that they can shadow um, to really kind of learn their, their way. That's a little different, I think, for people who are, are switching careers and I think that, you know, for for people who want to get into sort of supporting thought leaders at different stage of their careers, I think it's, you know, probably starting to kind of really build maybe a freelance business and really kind of helping people develop their thought leadership and then, you know, transition if they want to be in a more traditional kind of corporate role doing that. You see the number of jobs in the book publishing industry and in the business book publishing industry. Do you see the number of traditional publishers and jobs in traditional publishers increasing over the rest of the decade? I mean, that number always is like kind of in flux. You know, I mean, I, I definitely have seen Simon Schuster started Simon Acumen last year. So it was a new imprint specifically for 
business. I, I've seen other um, houses that have grown their certainly portfolio has grown the number of editors that they've had over the years. You know, and I think what's interesting about the business category is the certain houses have imprints that might be focused on business, but then there are also other more general nonfiction editors that do one or two business books a year. So it, it is interesting in that way. And then of course, there's, you know, more targeted publishers that do a large number of business books every year. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think if if you have a good idea and a good following um, and you're able to put the work into it, that there are lots of opportunities. Anything else you'd like to say about what about the agenting industry? Do you see that growing? If there are more business books published and more authors who want to get published, whether traditional publisher, self-published hybrid. Do you see the world of agency, of literary agents changing too? Let's say I don't think I've been an agent long enough to answer that question. If I were to say anything that most agents, the benefit of being an agent is you can represent lots of different things. So, you know, there's a lot of agents who represent business books and general nonfiction, but also do fiction and, and young adults. So I think that's a little bit hard to answer because of that. Danya, this has been great. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your experience. Let's stay in touch. I mean, we don't represent authors. We work with authors, thought leaders who want to get published. So they could certainly learn a lot from somebody like you. Well, thank you so much. This has just been an amazing opportunity. And it's, you know, I, I love being able to talk about publishing and helping thought leaders and, and writers sort of navigate this very unusual world that is the world of publishing. And so I'm really honored that you invited me to uh, participate in this. Yeah, and keep up the great blog post. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you left a like and if you shared the episode with your colleagues. Everything Thought Leadership is a video and podcast series from Boudet TLP. It's for thought leaders and thought leadership professionals, the people who help experts get recognized as thought leaders. You can find out more about Boudet Thought Leadership Partners at boudettlp.com.